Hey, listeners, this is a special event for us today. This is our 100th segment. 100 times we have talked 20 minutes about bees and all the ramifications of bees. Kim, what do you think? Are you sure about that count? Seems like a no. lot more to me. A lot of time has passed. One of us has really gotten old doing this, Kim. But <laughs> well, I'll t- I'll raise my hand for that one. I've gotten old lately. You know, one hundred sounds like a lot, but I was reading just several days ago that beekeeping probably has about a five thousand year history. Can we say that we've discussed? 5,000 years and 100 segments, 20 minutes at the time? I don't think so. I don't think so either. I'd like to do something special here and have us contact Jeff Ott. Let him be involved in this, too, since this is a special event. It's a good idea. I'm going to give him a call. I'll be right back. Hi, I'm Kim Flottam. Hi, I'm Jim Tew. And today we're going to talk about 5,000 years of beekeeping, and we're going to wrap it up in 20 minutes. Maybe. More or less. (laughs) You are listening to Honey Bee Obscura, brought to you by Growing Planet Media, the folks behind Beekeeping Today podcast. Each week on Honey Bee Obscura, hosts Kim Flottam and Jim Tu explore the complexities, the beauty, the fun, and the challenges of managing honeybees in today's world. Get ready for an engaging discussion to delight and inform all beekeepers. If you're a long timer or just starting out, sit back and enjoy the next several minutes as Kim and Jim explore all things honeybees. Jeff, Hi guys. come in. Are you there? I, I am here. I am here. I'm glad to be here. What are we doing? You're on the team today, and <laughs> we're going to play a new game where we bring somebody in as a special guest, and we don't tell them what they're going to talk about <laughs> until we start quizzing them. Well, so are you up for that? No, really, really. We were thinking about all the things that beekeeping has been through through all the years, and kind of where are we now and where were we then And I don't know if we're going to try to decide where we're going. That's overwhelming. (laughs) But beekeeping's had a colorful history. It definitely has. You know, we only got 20 minutes. Where are you going to start? Well, that's right. And we're (laughs) we're burning through a lot of it here. (laughs) (laughs) So where are you going to start? I want to go back just briefly to the fact that there are some indications in the Nile Valley that people were actually maintaining colonies, keeping colonies. About 5,000 years ago, we probably have about a 15,000-year lifespan overall on this whole thing. That's a lot of beekeepers over a lot of time. So first off, listeners, we're in a unique group. We go back a long way. And all those years ago, one of the hypotheses is that bees actually colonized us. We didn't colonize them, but bees moved into farm sites and went into empty pots and baskets and whatever. And the farmer was surprised to see that he had a hive of bees and what had heretofore been an empty basket. So there's one thought that says, well, that's how this whole skip thing evolved, was that the, the beekeeper didn't, the farmer didn't come up with it. The bees came up with it. Do you know anything about that, Kilmer, Jeff? Well, I know a little bit about it. There's been some things written about it that I've read over the years. And basically what it was, if you want to take all of the details and sum them up and put it into a couple of sentences, one day a lady went and overturned a basket and surprise, it was full of bees and honeycomb. And from there, life changed. Well, it's still changing, isn't it? The thing that also happened, you know, they had to kill those bees. Speak up here, Jeff. You said early (laughs) on when we were talking about this a few days ago, that uh, you thought that those bees were actually killed. Yes, yeah. they were. Talk. No, I was still thinking about the bees 5,000 years ago, and, and before they even moved into skeps or, or baskets, um, you know, beekeepers would find a tree that they were in and mark the tree and just rob the, the, the tree occasionally. Yeah, honey hunters. So I think, yeah, that's, that's a great start. And I <laughs> And it is always a joy and a, and a surprise to turn over something and find a 
colony of bees in it. Yeah, you're you're motivated again. You're young. You can leap <laughs> tall buildings. You can run fast. They're still very exciting. That's one of the things that hasn't changed very much about bees. They were stinging 5,000 years ago, and they'll be stinging this afternoon if I went out there and opened them. Jim and Jeff, part of this has to do with geography. If you go back that far and you're talking about trees, well, you got to have, you know, find, having a bee tree, you got to have a forest or you got to have a jungle. So you've got that. If you're in the desert of Egypt, there aren't a whole lot of trees out there. So then you're looking at cavities in buildings and in fences and in, you know, places like that. But the thing that ties all of this together is that people already knew that the bees that were in trees or in walls made honey. Yep. And made wax, and that was a desirable product. So where they were and how they got it, I think probably may be less important than the fact that they knew that it was it had value and that they should probably pursue this. I think that, that, that's 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 solid. That's a great great observation. Uh, not only because we think of honey as the the motivator, but there is also the wax. And and the and the protein yep. from the grub and everything else. So it was a one stop shop for people for many years. It was this really a useful bug. I hadn't thought about the wax, but you know, there's there's a a news item right now about a ship that's been found in Oregon that's still washing up beeswax chunks two hundred years later after the ship sank. And that beeswax was very valuable for nighttime light. Otherwise, it was dark in there, burning smelly beef tallow as a candle. You know, it's pretty fun to see all the excitement and stories you can generate just by throwing all your old burr comb out along the beach in Oregon. <laughs> <laughs> so you think someone might have done that? I, I, I'm, not, I, going I'm there. not saying who might have done that, but I'm just saying. Yeah, right. But it's... People are having an archaeological good time with that. <laughs> you know, I've, I, uh, I've, I'm a woodworker, and I've really enjoyed through the years looking at these old colonies and the structure and the design and the weirdness of them. One of the things that came along, there's, there's so many, many, many different styles and designs of those hives was the way people did the best they could with what they knew at the time. And one of the hives I built, I very carefully put the slanted bottom board back in it because in that particular hive, it was thought that the wax moths would drop off the comb and roll down the slanted bottom board and drop out in the yard where the chickens would eat them. That's amusing now, and it elicits a chuckle, maybe, but that didn't work. That didn't work at all. That was in the American Beehive by that a guy designed over here in Ohio. Jim, I want to back up a half a step. I mean, yeah. you've, ju you've jumped to the U.S. and making them beehives. Between discovering that bees made honey and wax and lived in trees and maybe lived in skeps, there's another, there's another step that you got to, I think you got to consider. And part of that is, part of that step is the fact that once people figured out how to keep bees and skeps, i.e. how to transfer a piece of a comb from one skep to an empty skep and let that then become a new beehive so that they had something for next year so they could harvest the one from this year. They were doing the same thing in stone walls in England at the same time. They were taking pieces of comb from one empty uh, from an empty from an empty hole in a fence, that they, a stone fence that they made, moved it to another empty hole in the stone fence that they made so they had a new one for next year and then they could harvest the one from this year. So there's, you know, the evolution of robbing and then robbing and and helping to continue evolve into the future and then finally keeping bees that we keep them today. There's several steps in there that you got to kind of, you got to not forget. Yeah, I, I agree. I don't, I didn't know I was forgetting it. I didn't know it was actually there in that way, but it's been a long, torturous path I agree with that. And those bee bowls you're describing, all those kind of things, pe people did the best they could with the information they had at the time. And the equipment they had. That makes me think about they were doing all that management of the honeybee, and we're, we're, we're not even up to the 1800s yet, without fully understanding the intricacies of the biology of the bee that we just obsess over today. Right. They didn't even understand that 
the queen was the one laying the eggs, or that. Oh, they did. They understood. Yeah, it was yeah, the king. It was, yeah, it was the king. Yeah, right. and you know, and and the earth was flat. They had everything figured out. <laughs> so now we're amused by that, but at the time, it was the best information available. And they were, and they kept them successfully, without a full understanding of the biology of the bee, which was fun to fun to think about. Kind of amazing yeah. as to what it was. Yeah, I think that's a scary thought. You don't have to know what you're doing for it to work. Huh. <laughs> that sounds like <laughs> yeah, my beekeeping right say, now. Uh, I'm thinking. <laughs> <laughs> the move from, from robbing completely to robbing and helping to mostly helping you know, I think that that mostly helping part kind kind of in the, it was somewhere in the eighteen hundreds. There were some people in Europe that were doing frames, not movable. But you know, the evolution there kind of was slow and and I'm going to say cranky because I'm I'm guessing there's a lot of stings involved in in working bees and frames that don't move and you don't have leather gloves and good veils, but. Um, you know, it kind of comes down to the next big step, I think, is going to be what? What's the next big step here? The removable frames. Yeah. Uh, there you go. There you go. In some form, format, someplace. Right. I don't, you know, there are people who claim it was in Europe. There are people who claim it was Langstroth. I think it's less important who rather than how did it work. And I think it probably, wouldn't you think that it happened in multiple places at different times? There was no internet. There's late breaking news. <laughs> so someone could do something in a remote village and uh, everybody could do it for several hundred years and a few thousand miles away. No one would know anything about it. So yes. I, there could have been multiple generations of these kinds of things before Common we ended up with all yep. these concept of taking Common these frames out. Yep. 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 Exactly. Well, it's much, much like Henry Ford is often credited for the first automobile, which he wasn't. He's the one who. Um, made it manufacturing, mass manufacturing of the automobile. And that's what his real claim to fame was. And that's much the same with Langstroth, isn't it? That the, so much of the, it is as, the, as the, uh, yep. the B space, it wasn't necessarily his observation that was the B space. He, he took all of that together and the movable frames and made it a mass marketable product. Well, in a way, up to this point, we've come a long way, but we haven't come a long way at all. We instead of clay pots and bee bowls and stone walls and whatever, we use plastic hives and wooden equipment. And boy, what we had to go through to get to that point, and we're still not finished evolving. You know, Jim, you jump, you took a jump here from from quite a while ago to almost to today, and I think that's a good time to sit down, take a deep breath, and listen to what our sponsor has to say today. Hey, has winter's chill and weather forced you inside? Well, did you know that Better Bee offers winter classes you can take from the comfort of your own home? Our classes are taught by Dr. David Peck and Eastern Apicultural Society Master Beekeeper Anne Fry. Our classes range from basic courses on essentials of beekeeping all the way up to specifics on planning for the seasons ahead and for your success. Visit betterbee.com forward slash classes to view all of our upcoming learning opportunities. There are oh so many different hive styles and designs, ideas. I mean, our burn pile and beekeeping history is just stunning on how big it is, on the good ideas that just didn't work. <laughs> Finally, one boiled down more or less to Langstroth. I know others in the world want to argue about it, but our hero here in our beekeeping industry tends to be Langstroth and the hive that he came up with, and then the variations on it that have followed up until this very day. You know, part of that has to do, and it hasn't changed much up until this afternoon, part of that has to do who controlled the press. And and it doesn't matter whether what you invent, if nobody knows about it, nobody knows about it. If somebody discovers what you've discovered and tells the world about it, then suddenly you're the hero. And that's kind of how Langstroth, I think, jumped into the forefront of okay. all this. He was discovered. Yep. There were so many people doing so much, but at, at he somehow he did something right. Maybe, maybe you're spot on, Kim, that he was in the, the right place at the right time. 
but it's still evolving. Would you would you guys agree to that? I mean, to this day, you, uh, Kim, you've got some kind of plastic hive in your backyard that came from England or the UK or somewhere, a, a hive designed. And what's up with that? Not only plastic hives, take it a step further. I had people contact me this week that want to find out more about artificially intelligent hives, hives that are run by machines and aren't visited by beekeepers more than once or twice a season. The artificial intelligence in the machine tells it when, when it's full of honey, when it needs to be fed, when it needs, when it needs, when it needs, when it needs. And interestingly, all of the things that it needs are stored up above the top of the hive in a compartment someplace. These artificially intelligent hives, are they going to be the future? Well, some people seem to think they are, and I'll go back to what's the press have to say about this. The people who discovered Langstroth's were the press first, and then the people who discovered artificially intelligent hives pollinating almonds out in California. Is that going to be next? It's you know who knows. I I don't I don't claim to know a bit. I don't. I can't get off the subject. But what I'm fearful of is that the almond people and other growers, developers, and plant propagators are on the job. And while we're making artificially intelligent hives, they're going to be making self-propagating varieties. Bingo. And that the whole thing won't even be a pollination issue anymore. <laughs> I don't know. We have jumped from 5,000 years ago to yes. 500 years from now. <laughs> so I, I really have a hard time seeing forward because so much could happen or not happen. You know, way back in the 70s, we we were breeding and selecting queens and learning to do instrumental insemination work. Dr. Rotham Bueller told me here at Ohio State, a grand old master of instrumental insemination and hygienic behavior, that the first instrumental insemination device he ever used used a mechanical pencil as a dispensing mechanism for releasing the semen inside the king, the queen. I mean, that was just as primitive as it can be, but they made it work. And now I see all this new modern instrumental insemination equipment. So there's all of that. But at the same time, I think many of the queens that are produced are still produced by the bees themselves. I mean, time and time again, you find out that you had a swarm go and they requeened themselves and there was no buying a queen, no instrumental insemination. The bees are still in control in many ways. And they're probably living in a tree. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, or living in my neglected hives, which could well, be a that tree. Too. That too. <laughs> you know, one th you know, there's a sidestep here we missed. And it's one that I I am particularly fond of. And one of the one of the one of the products of a beehive is mead, honey wine. And and that too has evolved over the years and it has the production of it. Um, has evolved from beekeepers being or winemakers being fussy about the source of the wine, the flavor of the wine or the honey, the source of the honey, the flavor of the honey, and then all of the production that goes into it from there. So that too has evolved along with the the, the all of the other things that bees have moved into in our in our time. Years ago, early '90s, Kim, you sent me to. I was living in Colorado. You sent me to Boulder to talk to the uh, the, the the lady who's a in charge of the American Meat Association, and I did an article on that for you. And she took me to her garage where she had these five gallon jugs of honey fermenting. I can't imagine that's evolved much from the five thousand years oh, ago. Oh, but it has fermenting honey. Oh, fermenting but it honey has. is fermenting honey, no matter where it ferments. <laughs> And I have no desire to drink mead today. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you mean this specific day or do you mean any day? Any day. And then I've alienated, a, you know, half our listers here right now because. Yeah. They just right. hung up me, on I'm you. sure mead is a wonderful product <laughs> and, and it's, it's been obviously there's many people enjoy it and smarter than I am. But it's yeah, that was an interesting discovery. Yeah. Mead. That's a good one. I'm surprised she wasn't making it in a skip. <laughs> <laughs> one of the one of the big I, I got to say we're, that I my thing is the big change, the really big change, has been pollination. Kim and I danced around it a bit ago. It may not stay the big thing, but right now it rules the bee mm -hmm. industry. 
And all those years ago, it wasn't that long ago, 150, 200 years ago, th nobody cared about pollination. But boy, we care about it now. So our world has flipped away from honey to this desirable food to pollination to get us all the other food. And it's, it's really big business in the bee industry. That's a big change. Take that a half a step further to support pollination in the bee industry. We, are, we have moved bees into controlled environments for overwintering. We control the air they, they breathe, the temperature they live in, the, the outside influences they're subjected to. Right now, everything we're doing to keep bees is to keep bees alive for pollination. Now, the question is, what happens when pollination, because as you are adequately stated, is become self-fertile uh, almond trees and self-fertile strawberries and all the other crops, because it's going to go there. It's got to go there. Uh, the, the genetics of crop has to change. Um, so once that happens, what's going to happen to indoor? What's going to what's going to happen to indoor overwintering? Will that explode so we can produce more honey, or is it going to go the way of the skep? It's interesting. This flop to pollination away from honey has only happened in the last what thirty years, Tw twenty years. All right, it's been a really short time, thirty yeah, to forty that's years. Amazing. I mean, we did we did apples and sure pumpkins and all of that, but almonds really have have been the driving right. force here. You know, we we do the same thing in many ways. We talk about indoor wintering and pollination and all these things, but I'm going to go out tomorrow and I'm going to light a smoker. Now, that's a nice smoker, but my, my ancestors all those years ago did something with, you know, a smoking rag or something, and they, they wrapped whatever they had around their head to try to keep the bees out of their eyes. Why? Because the bees were stinging. They sting today. They sting would stinging thousands of years ago or, or how far have we progressed i mean the bees are still the bees we we really haven't done a lot other than introduce mites and harass them along the way but the bees are still themselves you gotta wonder who's running who here all right who's in charge <laughs> i think it's funny that after five thousand years the current talk about keeping bees is back to natural, keeping them in logs. So I don't know if we've progressed very far at all. We're right back where we started. No, we know a lot more about those bees <laughs> in the log. I mean, we, we can recognize varroa mites and we're worried about virus infections. So those bees in the log are much better maintained now than they were bees in the log a thousand years ago. Yeah, they trained us pretty well, I think. Yeah, we have really been trained to keep these things alive. <laughs> I we know we couldn't do we couldn't do of justice in 20, 20, 25 minutes here or so on all of the history we've got. I I feel like that our bee experience is just a snapshot because I look at my fifty years of keeping bees and think, wow, this has really been a big deal. No, it hasn't. There's been a lot of other fifty years that have come and gone, and other people's snapshots. So this is just our time. This is just our phase of beekeeping. I don't know what will be happening in the future, but there'll be something going on with bees. It'll, it'll just have to be. It always has been. Yep. I think you got it right. Well, I hope you guys invite me back for your 200th episode, and we can talk about whatever new developments or old developments you want to at that time. Consider it, consider it, consider yourself invited, Jeff. I yeah, will. yeah. I'm still trying to get my arms around that. How old will I be then? 131? <laughs> no, I will not. I'm... <laughs> It seems like a lot, but I've had a good time doing these. I've had a good time in the hundred. I appreciate everyone who listens. I appreciate the sponsors for keeping us on the air. It takes a lot to keep it going. And 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 Jim, we gotta we gotta take a half step back and say thanks, Jeff, because behind all the stuff that you and I are doing every week, Jeff's making it happen. <laughs> He's right. Thanks, Jeff. Well, you're welcome. It's an honor and pleasure working with you both. And I'm looking forward to uh, the next 100 episodes. I had a good time. Me too. Thanks for letting me reminisce. <laughs> <laughs>